we're on. This is live from the table, the official podcast of New York's world famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99 Raw Dog and on the Laugh Button Podcast Network. And uh, this is 2021, our first show of the new year. This is Dan Natterman, of course. Noam Dorman is here. Periel Ashenbrand is here. We have with us Barry Friedman. Uh, Barry Friedman serves as the faculty director of the Policing Project at NYU School of Law, where he is the Jacob Fuchsberg, Professor of Law and Affiliated Professor of Politics. Welcome, Barry, and Happy New Year also, Barry, even though I just met you, but with the hell, Happy New Year to you. Um, so far. And you picked a hell of a night to come join us on the heels of what some are calling an insurrection. Uh, anyway, I guess I, I assume we'll talk about that. We have no real choice, but uh, Noam, uh, I don't know how you want to start things off. Um. I, I don't know. Uh, can you believe what's happening? <laughs> my, you know, my son, I, I, I ran out with my wife to do some errands and yeah. my kids turned on the television and started to call us alarmed at what was going on. They were incredibly upset. I told them it was probably going to be fine. Uh, but my son then asked me, is today going to be in the history books? And I thought about it a moment and I said, quite possible. It's very possible today is going to be in the history history books. Oh, absolutely. I, th I think that the, I think it'll be in the history books. I don't think that the date January 6th will be a date that we remember like December 7th or 9-11, uh, although I suppose it's possible, but um, I think the event will be in the history books. Yeah, it's really. But what do you think? What do you guys think is really going on here? I mean, what is really going on? I, I mean, from one from one angle, uh, and first of all, I, I should start by by admitting that I didn't think Trump would take it to take it this far. You know, I I thought he would, I thought he'd see the writing on the wall and, and back down. Um, I should have known better in a certain sense because one of my insights into him has always been that he he doesn't have the sense to um, conform his behavior to his own self interest. I mean, obviously, this is this is at the point now um, damaging to him. He's becoming a laughing stock, but he still can't help himself. But anyway. You know, without without the courts and the military, he never really hoped to, to keep power, right? So what what is all this, and what do you think he's after here? I mean, I you know, I'm not a psychologist. You should have had a psychologist on if that was the question that you wanted to talk about. <laughs> if I were a psychologist, I would think he's perhaps psychotic, and therefore you are observing psychotic behavior because that's what it looks like to me. I think, I think that's a good psychosis doesn't usually manifest itself in the in, in the 70 when you're 75 I mean you know not extreme narcissism or something right <laughs> yeah psychotic and lame in terms he's, he's mashuga then <laughs> right true true psychosis I don't think we're dealing with here but uh, yeah mashuga is another uh, is another um, well, issue, people, but... people do lose I mean I mean the only the only thing I can come up with is that is a, a, a late onset psychosis. The only example I can give you is Scarlett O'Hara's father in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> he seemed pretty, uh, pretty solid until he lost his wife and his plantation. And then, and then he, he, which I always thought was, by the way, a weak point in the novel. But in any case. Is that Mr. Kennedy? No, no, Scarlett O'Hara's father, remember? He went mad. Yeah, what's, what's his name? His name was Gerald O'Hara. Oh, Gerald O'Hara, oh, Scott O'Hara, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Ken Mr. Kennedy was the guy he married, right? He married Mr. Kennedy yeah. after her first husband died. She married Mr. Kennedy, yeah, yeah. I got uh, who was killed in a in some sort of a KKK operation. So KKK. I mean, y'all are very impressive. <laughs> right. I mean, we want, we we want to talk about the police, but it's it's hard to talk about the police today with with what's going on. Um, it's actually easy to talk about the police today. If you go ahead, bring us into though, it because. Uh, you know, I, 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 like the rest of us, sat through months of protests about policing in which the police responded in an incredibly heavy-handed fashion. And then on an utterly predictable day when there was going to be a large crowd in the nation's capital where we've built up barriers and, and all kinds of things to keep people away from public buildings, this mob just found its way into the U.S. Capitol. And so I, I have all kinds of questions for the police. Those are the people I'd really like to talk to. So, yeah, I have to admit that I was doing homeschooling all day so what were they under undermanned is that what you're saying i mean that's a generous view of what happened i i've seen 
a couple of, I don't want to judge until I know the facts. That's my nature. And the one thing I'm sure about is that we need to have a complete inquiry of everything that happened today and understand exactly who was responsible. You know, I, there are people on the right now claiming that it was Antifa and it wasn't uh, the MAGA folks in the Capitol, though, if you were looking at the folks carrying Confederate flags, they look like MAGA folks to me. Uh, but there's one clip where there are a bunch of uh, protesters, that's not the right word, rioters, what insurrectionists, whatever word you want to use, at a gate, and there are not enough police officers there. But it looks like the police officers just step back and let them in. I mean, it is incredible. And so at, at, the, at the least, I think you have rank incompetence. And at the most, I wonder whether there isn't some complicity. So my nature is to judge having little to no information. That's what you um, do. <laughs> I mean, I I think that it's fair to say that if that were if the, if those were all far left or black protesters, that I mean, they would all probably be dead by now. All of them, just mow them down. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Sorry, Els. Is that, did that what ha is that what happened in the in the other protests when there were black and follow protesters have been mowing them down? Oh, where was there was no pepper spray, right? Or, or no, there was tear gas. Today and, and good and good. Yeah, I mean that's what I read. Good. I hope there was. I heard. I read that they were they were warning the congressmen to to get out of the way. No, that's true. They did. There, there was conversation about they didn't have masks and the whole bit. But you know, look, you knew that there was going to be this. We all knew this was not news that there was going to be. A day of, you know, uh, Trumpers flowing into Washington, D.C. and having a gathering and to not have all hands on deck then after what we've watched in city after city. Uh, I, I think the contrast, that was the first thing that struck me about this was that there was a double standard going on here that was very, very hard to understand. I guess I just didn't expect it to happen. I mean... I mean, you say complicity mean that somebody gave the order to let them in or something? That's no, I, no, I don't mean to, to to suggest that. I, I mean, I certainly hope not. But I think there's a there's a sufficient sympathy for you know one side of this among the police, and so maybe you're not at your sharpest. Maybe you're more willing to tolerate certain behaviors that you act you know excessively toward the other side. I mean, there was. Uh, I can only comment so much on New York because I'm, I'm an advisor to the uh, state attorney general on how the NYPD conducted itself, but I watched protests throughout the country and, you know, it seemed to me that there were many instances, there were, there were protests that got out of control without any doubt, particularly on the West Coast, but in many cities there were perfectly peaceful folks doing what they're supposed to do under the First Amendment of the Constitution, which is to petition their government for redress of grievances, and, you know, they were met with with uh, kettling and pepper spray and all kinds of tactics that have no place uh, in a democracy when there's orderly demonstrations. Well, I think that I, I agree with you. I think we have, um, although I, I don't agree with you in all cases, in some cases stuff I saw, I thought the, the police should have been harder. I mean, I, you know, as people's lives were ruined and their businesses burned and-, and yeah, yeah, yeah they, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, 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 um, the thing about all these, situations is that they're a hodgepodge some incidents some some incidents uh are underplayed some are overplayed and partisans and people with agendas want to you know see them all one way and that's just not the way the world works you know so i'm i'm a civil libertarian guy like you and i and there's no question that the police are heavy handed sometimes and sometimes they've been told to stand down when we really needed their help I mean, you can look at the LA riots if you want to see a really heartbreaking yeah. example of that, right? Um, but it's such a terrible, perfect storm here. First of all, I do believe there's a normalizing, a contagion effect of seeing <laughs> rioting that just be, it just normalizes. B, the pandemic. C, this crazy Trump. D, this enabling. These people like Ted Cruz, who obviously never thought Trump was going to stay in office, but thought they could cynically hitch their wagon to the cause in, in the hope that this will help them in 2024 and was playing with fire. And um, the fire, you know, started a, started a forest fire. Shame on him. Um, I don't think he's coming back from this. I don't think Trump's coming back from this. 
And I'm a guy who, you know, not was not particularly anti-Trump. I never supported him, but I, I was wasn't I defended him many times. But this is indefensible, right? And um, and at the same time, we don't want to overreact to it because we do tend to overreact to things. We overreacted to 9/11 even. I mean, it's very human to overreact to things. And I and I did draw another analogy, and then I, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Friedman talk a lot. But I just wanted to because there was it was an email conversation I had. I do think that there's such contempt that very few people are thinking what's best for the country. And I would say what's best for the country now really would be a bipartisan audit of this election. Not because I think Trump won the election. I think that's absurd. But because, you know, 40% of the country does think that way. And they are no longer going to take the media's word for it. The media told them, even in recent history, Trump was lying about a vaccine. 50 intel former intelligence operatives said that Hunter Biden was um, uh, Russian dis disinformation. I mean, there, there was case after case. This is the first wolf that Trump claimed that turned out to be fake. I says it like a uh, boy who cried wolf in reverse. And they're just not going to take the media's um, word for it. And, I, and I'll make a, a, an analogy that maybe Mr. Friedman will be angry about. I don't know. Just like on the left, or not just on the left, just like so many people see a, a video of a cop killing somebody, for lack of a better word, and cannot put that in perspective in terms of a nation of 300 million people and the hundreds of thousands of interactions with police that happen all the time, and they immediately jump from that to wanting to dismantle police departments. A lot of Trump supporters are not able to see a bag of votes found here and a bag of votes found there and a little election impropriety found there, which is, you know, they are finding these things and have the perspective to say, but this doesn't mean the election was fraudulent. This doesn't mean we have to burn the whole thing down. These are basically isolated incidents which have to be dealt with um, in, in, a, in, a, in a localized way. This is very human, I think, to not be able to see things, to be able to conceive of things in perspective. We are not equipped for the information evolutionarily. We're not equipped for what we're getting now in terms of every single thing that happens in the world showing up on our phone and being able to put that, do the math to understand that this is one incident in a, in a planet of billions. And people are just flying off the handle in every direction when they see something that, that and I don't know what the answer to this, but this is, this is the challenge of the next part of our history. This is not going away. We're gonna, we overreact, we flail from left to right. And um, so, so to, to end with what I started, it would be very healthy. Biden would benefit immensely from a bipartisan commission that just laid it all out there and showed that this didn't happen. I know they don't want to do it because they don't want to give any credence to it, but I think 40% of the country believes this stuff. And how are we going to convince them it didn't happen? I don't, by the I media don't know reporting that, it? I don't by know CBS, CBS News is going to tell them it didn't happen? CNN is going to tell them it didn't happen? That's not going to work. I don't know that a bipartisan commission would work. I mean, once people get their teeth into, into this kind of thinking, I think it's very tough to, to dissuade well, them. I'm going to go to my grave believing that sunlight is the best, the only disinfectant. It's not perfect. It's not going to convince everybody. It maybe will convince a third. But I'm not going to wrap myself in the fact that Twitter and Facebook need to start con con conquering this with some sort of censorship that's that's clearly not going to work. And I don't want to live in that country. So I really, I just think it, everything needs to be aired as much as it can. And um, I mean, I've read some articles that were pretty convincing about election fraud. And the only reason they were convincing is because I didn't have access to the facts. I mean, I knew in my gut this can't be true, all the stuff I'm reading. But then I had to do real research and say, oh, well, no, actually, Georgia did a re You know, I, everything could be debunked. But who's going to take the time to do that? And, and, and how many people have the background to be able to do that, that kind of research? You know, people are average and, and they have lives. They don't have got the time to do this stuff. And really the media, I mean, really this, this little vaccine story is really kind of telling because they did. They fact checked Trump in the debate and they, and they didn't just say it was unfounded. They said he was lying that the vaccine would be available in 2020. Lying. But they had no basis for that. Now, what happened? I mean, maybe that's why Cuomo didn't bother preparing 
a plan to get the vaccine in New York or in California because they believed that this was all a lie. Like if they really believed what Trump was saying or if there, if, that there would be a vaccine in 30 days or less, I imagine Cuomo was saying, hey, shit, we need to get on this. There's going to be a vaccine in three weeks. But no, every network said it's a lie. It's not going to be for another year at least, right? This is what they reported. This, this is all part of the story. Everywhere you look. And one more thing, and I really will shut up. What you said about incompetence. There's incompetence everywhere. You get the feeling that people like de Blasio and Cuomo are like, holy shit, I never thought I would actually have to, to handle something. Like, I never thought I was going to have to be an executive and actually do things. Our leaders run on poetry now. Whoever has the best poetry wins. And, and there's such a vast thing we expect from them, we can't even judge whether they can do anything right anymore. D D Bloomberg one time didn't clear the streets of snow. Remember that? And he got a lot of trouble because the snow wasn't cleared on time. But otherwise, who the fuck knows what these people do? And I don't think Cuomo or de Blasio ever imagined in a million years that they'd actually be responsible for rolling up their sleeves and managing something the way like I have to manage a restaurant. They just, you know, they're just figureheads. It's all empty suits. Same thing probably with whatever who's running DC. Where are we not led by empty suits anymore? Who's, the, who's a capable leader? Can you name one? Biden? Who? All right, I'm done. <laughs> you put a lot on the table. <laughs> yeah. that, was a, that was a long, uh, one of your longest, I dare say. Yeah, but it's what I've been thinking about lately. And I, and I, don't, I don't hope that doesn't sound like a partisan thing. It's not. I, I love my country. I want what's best for the country. I don't really care if they raise taxes or lower taxes. That's not an important issue right now. I, uh, I'm glad that we're taping for about six hours so we can yeah. work through all of that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, go ahead, Mr. Freeman. You, no, you, I mean, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't, and you can call me Barry. Uh, so he always does that, Barry. He, he, he leads with the mister. I have two reactions to that diatribe. The first is, uh, you know, which you really want to get on here, uh, because I'm an airsats constitutional, I mean, I'm a constitutional law professor, but the first amendment isn't my specialty, but, you know, uh, and, and I have a good friend, for example, at the university of Chicago, who's deeply immersed in all of this. We used to have this, we had, we had fewer channels of communication. We had a fairness doctrine, which said that you had to have equal time for both sides of something. And people got two sides of something. They got, they got more of a story. And you're absolutely right that we all live in our little silo where we get whatever collection of facts we want. And in that silo, I, I mean, I might not have believed it prior to the last couple of years, but I believe it now. You can get fed anything and believe it if you're not hearing anything else. And so I think it is exactly right that that, you know, but that's a problem. Like we haven't figured out how to reconcile the First Amendment with that problem. And that is just a huge, huge social policy problem that, that maybe is at the top of the list up there with, you know, global warming. Because if we can't uh, manage to operate from a, the same set of facts, we can't have same conversation. And if we can't have same conversation, we can't live peaceably. And that's what we learned today. So that's that's that, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you'd like. Um, you know, on the, on the, just because you brought up the police shooting and, and that's tumbled in and out, and that was what we were going to talk about tonight was policing. Uh, you know, what I would say, first, I just want to point out that we're a bunch of white folks talking about policing, and I know you tried to not have that be the group of us, and it didn't work out that way, but I, I try never to be in a group of white folks talking about policing because we're usually not the folks being policed. Uh, and I think it's important to have conversations with people who are impacted by the thing that you're talking about. Just to tell the listeners, we had, we had, uh, um, we had someone scheduled and for whatever reason, at the very last minute, they didn't appear. They so got so. arrested actually. <laughs> no. Go ahead. You never know. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think, I think, um, look, I, I live in the world of policing. Uh, I spend a lot of time with folks in impacted communities. I spend a lot of time with police, the policing project that I uh, run. It's an article of faith that we work with all stakeholders. I know lots of really terrific cops. There's just no doubt about it. Very impressive people. But the institution itself is broken. Uh, it's broken in a lot of ways. And this kind of feeds into your, your little talk there, which is uh, it's broken because we don't want to see the truth about it. You know, people want to be on one side or the other of this. They want to be for the police or against the police. 
Uh, and if you take that perspective, instead of really looking at a situation and saying, what are the problems and how do we fix them? You never fix them. Uh, and I think, and I think that's where we are with policing, which is- yeah, Everything seems to be, you mentioned all or nothing. Isn't that the discourse, isn't everything about kind of an all or nothing discourse these days? Either Trump is the devil or Trump is a savior. Either immigration, either we got to open the borders or we got to uh, not let anybody in. I, almost every conversation, even if we get into Me Too, either you believe all women or you or you say they're all lying whores. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any middle ground in any of the discussion. Some of them are lying whores. Is that what you mean? <laughs> That's a little ground. <laughs> Go ahead. No, that, that would be a little ground. But I mean, like, like, you, know, they, you know, every time there's a Me Too incident, the question is, who do you believe? Yeah, no, no. Who do you believe is not the appropriate point, question. The appropriate question is, is what is more likely? I mean, I don't believe anybody unless I hear all well, the facts. The appropriate, the appropriate question for all of this, and I think Noam, you know, is right about his point about suits. Uh, I have this huge respect for technocrats, right? People that actually try to understand problems and solve them. And I've been fortunate in my life to work with some really, really good people who are really good at running stuff. And I learned the lesson that you can you can fix things if you try to run them. Uh, and that and I do think that you know our politics has become shrill and empty and embarrassing. You know, you said you love the country, and I, I've always been such a patriot, but I I'm embarrassed to the core. I mean, I have lost so much faith in the people I inhabit this space with. Uh, everything that, you know, I've learned just how short-sighted people are and how incautious and selfish and greedy. Uh, and it's hugely disappointing to me because we are facing a set of serious, serious problems. And, but, but they are not beyond our capability to address. They never have been. And it's never been the spirit of this country to sort of look at a problem and say we can't tackle that. But we are just tripping over our feet and making fools of ourselves right now. And yet, and yet at the same time, at the same time where there is reason to be self-conscious, embarrassed, whatever word you want to use about being an American, I mean, we are at the height of our badassery in so many ways as a country. We used to have embarrassing automobiles. I mean, the Ford Pinto, hello. Now we've got Tesla. The biggest, baddest car company on the block is an American company. We have Apple computers. Uh, you know, we have Facebook, we have we the vaccine, that was us, you know, more or less. I mean, it was us and, and, and some other companies, but a lot of it was us. We're kind of at the height of our powers in many ways. Yeah, our private sector is still quite good. And, and I think our public sector, first of all, I think fewer people than ever before by far would even consider a life in the public sector right now. I mean, I, I toyed with it at one time, just who wants to be attacked and taken down and they find it on email or they find some disgruntled person or, or you're, you're like, it's, it's people who can make good money on the outside. Um, it's asking a lot for them to be ruined by running for office and be this, I was alluding to the poetry. Listen, I had a lot of beefs with Mayor Bloomberg and, um, and I didn't like, uh, in particular, his his stop and frisk stuff. I uh, you know I don't know if when he apologized he meant it or it was just politics. But and I'm I'm a just so you know Barry I'm a pretty right wing guy. But I always thought what was going on with stop and frisk was 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 just wrong. But anyway, is there any doubt that we would want Bloomberg right now when we're trying to do this vaccination? I mean Jesus Christ, like we have to understand what's important and. We just lost sight of the fact that at some point we also need people who can actually do the job. Yeah. It's not yeah. just about them saying flowery things and the fact that they never insulted anybody and that they tip their hat to the right people. It's like, you know, you need somebody who, who can do it and Bloomberg could do it. I, th you're, you're absolutely right about the capability of governing. You know, one of my heroes is Winston Churchill who nobody could stand until they were in total trouble and then that was who they turned to because he could solve problems. And, yeah. and you need those people. Bloomberg was completely wrong about stop and frisk. I mean, I'd love to get to have a candid conversation with him someday about exactly what it was he was thinking. I mean, it's not crazy what he was thinking. Um, you know, my students who are always extremely upset about stop and frisk, I will often stand in the aisle in the classroom and I'll say, let's just stop and think about this for a minute. I mean, Michael Bloomberg's a smart guy. 
but for this, I'd turn a lot of governing over to the guy. I mean, he's, you know, he's got hands down over a lot of the people we've got running things right now. Uh, what was going on? You know, what he thought was, if we just jack up everybody when they walk out of their houses, uh, well, I should take a step back. Michael Bloomberg hates gun violence. And he has put his money where his mouth is. I mean, he's set up a huge foundation to deal with the problem. It's, it's a really, really serious problem. And it just, it, 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 it's, I mean, I've never talked to him about it, but it's obvious how much it upsets him. And so he figured if you just jack up everybody when they walk out of their house, they're gonna leave their guns at home. And that, that's not insane. It's just completely unconstitutional and disrespectful of human beings. And, uh, and you know, it's just, it, it was, I mean, it's interesting. Another hero of mine is Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt, but he made some huge missteps, right? You know, one of them was certainly going along with the Japanese internment was huge and yeah. packing the court and we're trying to pack the court in retrospect. That's complicated whether that was a, a mistake or not, actually. We could talk about court packing if you want to talk about everything but policing. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, you're right. I, one other thing I want to say, just because now I understand how the show works and I get to talk for as long as I can until somebody manages to barge in. Uh, you know, you were talking about the private sector and the private sector, um, you know, it has advantages and disadvantages. And one of the advantages is the profit motive. And one of the disadvantages is the profit motive. So uh, that's why you need regulation. I mean, we, we're seeing that with Facebook now, right? I mean, Facebook is a disaster for the country in, in, in many, many ways. But I saw an interesting thing on Twitter right before we started, which is two groups that have come out and condemned what happened today in terms that I'll tell you in a moment were startling, were the National Association of Manufacturers and the US Chamber of Commerce. Now those are both super conservative groups that have had a lot of money flowing into them to try to get, you know, to ease up regulation and let them do whatever it is that they want to do. I mean, and the National Association of Manufacturers called this an insurrection and suggested invoking the 25th Amendment. So what you see, and, I, and, I, and we've seen industry speaking up more and more about Trump, and it's really fascinating, is Folks whose vested interest is their pocket don't have much time for this nonsense. Like it was all great when they could get the judges that they wanted and they could get the tax cuts that they wanted, but this is runs the risk of interfering with their making money. And they have, you know, that's, they got no patience for that. Absolutely. I mean, you, well, I have to say, when you say they're, they're making money, it's, it's, it sounds a little cynical. I mean, making money is, um, you know, we all depend on our pipelines and making money. I'm but, all for yeah. capitalism. I'm yeah. not, you're not, you're not going to find yeah, I mean, criticizing. And I think um, it makes the world go around. You got to, well, it's just, you know, it's how, it's how we feed our children. It's how we have our lives. It's how we, you know, we don't have much time on earth. And we, this is how we make the best of it. We have to, you know, that, and that's, that's what's important to us. Um, right. Let's talk about the police for a second. So I can make the moral case for Bloomberg. And I think it's kind of what you were backing into, which is that from Bloomberg's point of view, he would say, listen, a hundred fewer people died because of this policy. You want to be the guy who says, you, you know, let's have a hundred more deaths. But, and, and, and that is a difficult, it's not a racist trade-off. It's a difficult trade-off. But I think that he, like, a, and this is his weakness in most areas that he was weak. He just didn't have the life experience to understand how many people were being humiliated every day. If it had happened to him twice, he would have backed off that policy in some way, or at least changed it some way. Yeah. Hundred that you know. So I'll tell, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who I'm going to allow to remain nameless in this story, but a very very accomplished academic, and you know, coming at things both with a good heart and from the left. And one of the things at the policing project that we, our our main thing that we believe is that the you know, public should have a say in how they're policed. And that's not how we've done things in this country. And then the other thing that we believe in a lot is science and cost benefit analysis. And uh, I had this conversation with this guy. And he said, you know, the problem with bringing cost benefit analysis to stop and frisk is if you save 100 lives and you value a life, life at, you know, $9 million, which is something like we tend to do in the environmental sphere, that's like a lot of money. It, take, it takes a lot of harm to overcome that benefit that you think you're getting from stop and frisk. But even he wasn't picking it apart. When you start to look at the number of people, you know, what dollar figure do you put on the humiliation that they experience? What dollar figure do you put on? There are studies now that are starting to show that, you know, in these neighborhoods where there's huge stop and frisk, but like kids aren't doing as well in school. Right. Uh, people are declining to vote. They're doing all kinds of things. And so this is the biggest problem with policing in many ways is that, is that we 
police first and ask questions later. We don't think about the social costs of what we're doing. And it's really sad because, I mean, I'll tell you what makes me crazy is not being smart. Okay. You know, that's what makes me totally crazy. And there's so many times when we could address problems in a smart way without humiliating people, but it's just not been the nature. Can I, can I add to that? There's also something that can be a little facile or um, maybe that sounds intentional, but what happens with cost benefit analysis is that it can sometimes just be wrong. I know many times in my business, this happened recently with something as stupid as um, bagging the phones so that the, uh, the public wouldn't be able to have their cell phones during the show. I won't go into the whole story, but it just, that's, that's the most recent example. When you take an option off the table, all of a sudden, the smart minds uh, put attention to the problem in a way that they never did before about what other way can we achieve this benefit. So when, yeah, stop, stop and frisk was an easy way to save those 100 lives. But that doesn't mean that if you take stop and frisk off the table, that there wouldn't be other ways that would, people would come up with to save those same 100 lives. Necessity is the mother of invention. And there is something that is a good management technique to say, listen, I don't care. We're not doing it this way anymore. And also, by the way, we're not going to have 100 people die. So now go in that room and you figure it out. And maybe we need trial and error, but we're going to figure out a way to save these 100 lives without humiliating people. And, that's, and, that's, and you push that down from the top. And then more often than not, you'll be amazed what will, will bubble back up. But that's, that's how cost-benefit analysis is supposed to work. You know, pe people think that what you do is you, and, and partly you do, you take a piece of paper, you draw a line down the middle, like here's the cost, here's the benefits, let's put a value on each of them, and then we decide. But that's wrong. One of the things we try to teach at the policing project is you take that, and we, this is how we think, you know, I've got this, this um, background up here, right, which is about facial recognition. And so, you know, People look at technologies and they, they fight over them like everything else you've been describing. You know, we're for it, we're against it, let's ban facial recognition, let's have facial recognition. What you're supposed to do is say, what are the benefits we think we can get from it? What are the harms that are gonna come from it? And then can we think of a policy, can we think of an approach that lets us get the benefits and gets rid of the harms? That's exactly what you're supposed to do is go into that room and say, is there another way to, if the expression is crack that egg, right? And that's. That's what we just don't do. And I don't, you know, you said something way early in the, in the taping here about, um, you know, where we are today versus where we are in the past. And I started to bridle at that because I always bridle at people who say that. Uh, I wrote a book about the relationship between public opinion and the Supreme Court. And, I, and it caused me to, you know, track U.S. history pretty closely for 200 and many years. And one of the things you learn when you do that is, you know, the more things change, the more they're the same. They, you know, you say things are like this today and they were different before, it turns out it's almost never true. They were, they were just as bad in some ways back then. Um, and so it's hard to know whether, how we've actually changed. I mean, I feel it alive here, as I'm sure all of you do, right? Which is that the time we're living in now is unique and is nothing like how politics looked uh, in the past. And you can, there are examples of it. You know, there was a time when there was this club in the Senate of people from the left and the right we had lunch together once a week, Democrats and Republicans. I don't know how big the club was at its biggest, but you know, it might've been like 25 people and eventually it went to zero. They just don't communicate anymore. And so I, that is a problem and it's what keeps us from being smart. So you're right to point Dan to the way that, you know, in some ways private industry is crushing it and government is just completely failing us. I mean, I'd love to know why the vaccine disasters happening. I, I think part of it is not just the state. I think it's the federal government. I think that they failed completely to plan for a rollout. Like they just, they dropped that ball. But I'm, I'm furious. I get calls, you probably are too, from people all over the country who are getting the vaccine. Yeah. And here in New York, it's like, I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. I mean, of course, I, I, I just assume everybody did a lousy job. The federal government, obviously, but I mean, when you, when you read about what's going on in New York, I mean, they can't even figure out a way to blame the federal government at this point, you know? I mean, it's just, I mean, Cuomo, you think maybe he shouldn't have been writing that mission accomplished book that he, I mean, what the hell is with I, these I people? I'm still with you. And, you know, I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know enough about this issue, so let me speak to it eloquently, the, uh, uh, because why should I be different than anyone else in the country? So, you know, he, he but I did, I think his authoritarian streak is just defeating him and all the rest of us right now. So he's, you know, he's like, 
hundred, a million dollar fine if you vaccinate somebody who should be vaccinated. And yes, they don't have the people in the first category that we want vaccinated, but we are not going to move on to the second category. We're going to ascribe blame to the hospitals that can't finish the first category. And it's like, what are you thinking? Like, just find some arms and start sticking some needles in them and let's go. Like, day and night, Times Square, let's be doing it. Before we blame the federal government, I mean, we still have to get over the hurdle. Can you believe they were taking holidays and weekends and after hours off on this vaccine stuff? I mean, what the hell? This is a pandemic. People are dying and they're not vaccinating 24-7? I mean, you can't... You can't and, and that's imagine what that implies about everything we don't know about what's going on. How, how yeah, you're you're exact. You are exactly right. I mean, I don't I don't understand which part of this is a disaster you don't get. But I mean, you're you're a you know a business person. I mean, you know it's it's interesting. I've got a a, a daughter who sometimes thinks she'd like to be a, a comic. So I said I'm going to take you to a com- a comedy club if we can ever go to one again. I mean, it's like this is ridiculous and. You know, I, I, I crave going to a restaurant and having somebody bring me a piece of stemware that I don't have to clean myself and pouring some wine into it. Like, that's my fantasy in the world. <laughs> uh, and everybody's suffering. And the idea that we are not fully mobilized. And this, you know, this is, again, I've thought, I, I didn't live through World War II, obviously. None of us did, but we've read a lot about it. And I do think that there was a sense of shared esprit and sacrifice in the country that we have just lost. I think this is what ends republics if you want to really dour look at it, which is, is that if you can't manage to find the, you know, shared respect for people and the willingness to jump in and take some of the burden on yourself and not be selfish, that you're absolutely right. Why we're not out there day and night vaccinating people is a mystery to me. Yeah, I, I think the republic will bounce back, but I, I, I don't know. But, but so I want to talk about the police too, but Carol, you wanted to say something? Well, I have a question, um, and maybe it's relevant and maybe it's not, but you know, I'll just take our Jew factor to like the nth power while we're at it. So I have a lot of family who's in Israel and um, they're vaccinating everyone there. I mean, it's, they, they've vaccinated, there are 9 million people in the country and I think over a million have been vaccinated already. Um, can I mean, is there any explanation how I, and so I spoke to my aunt today who's about to turn 80 and she was just vaccinated and she said it's just astonishing to watch from the other side, like big, powerful America who everybody thinks is, you know, I don't know, so strong and so far ahead of everyone is so far behind on this. Yep. I mean, Israel's not run by, and you can say what you want about Netanyahu, but he's not an empty suit, you know? I mean, the, 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 guy, is, the guy is very capable. It's, it's what his goals are that may, people may object to, but no, he's not um, Trump. He's not de Blasio. He's not Cuomo. The guy is very, very capable. So it's because- And, of- and, the, country, and the country is quite capable, obviously. Look what they do. I mean- I mean, it, it's astonishing, you know, and, and it's- Well, look, look have, you read, have you read the articles about the, the, the way the Koreans are, are uh, what's the matter, Dan? Oh, Dan, 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 your mic is off, Dan. Oh, here, here I am. Have you read the articles about the way the Koreans are managing? I mean, they have such a thorough procedure of entering and leaving that country. And I mean, not, not, it, it, I mean, I've complained about this before. Everything here is kind of like on the honor system. I mean, wear a mask, but if you don't wear a mask, it's okay. And you're, yes, officer, right? Like they, nothing's taken seriously, no real fines. They don't treat it as seriously as urinating on the street. In Korea and, and, and the countries that are serious, I mean, they are imposing strict standards of behavior on people. When they, when they tell you to quarantine, it's not on your honor, you quarantine. And if you don't, you go to jail or whatever it is, you know? And the results speak for themselves. I mean, uh, maybe, we were t- maybe we don't want to live that way. Go ahead. We were talking before about the country that people care about each other, and, and America is, a, you know, built on the frontier spirit, spirit of independence, which has its place, and there's a lot of good to be said about it. But there are times when you need to all get together and have a common goal. I mean, you know, um, the Koreans. First of all, they're all Korean. I don't know, you know, and there have been studies that say that people that are all one thing tend to trust each other more. It's okay, Peter. Bynard referred to the same study, so you're okay then. You, you can know, get away um, with it. So, 
you know, that might be relevant. Maybe uh, the fact that we're so multi-ethnic. On the other hand, Canada's almost as multi-ethnic as we are, and they seem to be have a more of a, a all-for-one spirit. I mean, this is self-interest here. I mean, this is not, I, I understand, but this isn't about caring for others. This is just, the, I really, we are just, and cynicism of government, which you hear is seems to be far greater than, although in France, by the way, you know, as I watch French news, because, you know, I study the language as part of my studies, there, there's a lot of cynicism and a lot of skepticism about the vaccine. They have a very high rate of skepticism with regard to the vaccine and of, of and, they, and many of them also think that the government is, is, is conspiring that this whole thing is a conspiracy of this whole pandemic. So we're it, not the only ones. Yeah, I mean, I, it's really, a, we should be ashamed of ourselves, really. Well, like I, I said, other countries oh. are, are- We'll get our shit together, we always do. It, and um, It is inexcusable across the fucking board. It really is. Look, you can't have everything. We have the best music. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we have the best music. England has good music, but we have amongst the best music. Have you ever listened to like pop music from from other countries? It's, it's, I listen to it. <laughs> and we have, you know, the, the companies, like I said, the technology. So, I mean, I don't know that Facebook is something to be showing off about right now. I, I think you're right, by the way. I think Facebook and particularly Instagram in particular are nothing to be proud of. But there's yeah, a lot of a lot not to be proud of. So I'm going to have to leave you because I have to go deal with policing. Wait, wait, guys, do one question for you. Can I get time for one more question? Yeah, but you know what? You have to make me a promise. Sure. Which is you have to have me back on to talk about policing. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I'm envious because I, you know, I realize I'm in the wrong business. Like if I was in y'all's business, I could just say anything, which would be fun. I'm kind of, I, I wish I could get like a pass on everything for just like, you know, 45 minutes to get to say anything. And I would have a really good time to get that out of my system. But yeah. in the meantime... Yeah. But this is the thing. You, but this, this is it, Barry. First of all, obviously today was a ridiculous day. So you know, it, was, it, was, it almost looked ridiculous to, to not talk about the elephant in I, on, I on the mall. Agree. I agree. But um, uh, next time that there's, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm sure there will be at some point a, another incident where the police are front and center in the news. Let's try to get you on like that week or the week after. So it's you know, but I because I, what I really wanted to talk, what I wanted to talk to you about initially when I found you and I asked Beryl to contact you was qualified immunity and what your feelings were about qualified immunity. Because I'm quite skeptical of getting rid of qualified immunity. So I'll tell you. Yes. Yeah. You asked. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you should just tell people what it is too. Chris. It is interesting that you found me. I mean, we, in, in normal life, when our, when we were going to our offices, our, yours and my office, we could throw a rock from one to the other. I know. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, so look, the, 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 the rule is that, uh, if the police harm somebody, a police officer harms somebody, the, you sue them, people sue, it's America, that's what you do. And uh, you know, when people are responsible for things, they pay. But the police have this magic shield that the Supreme Court has given them called qualified immunity. And what qualified immunity says is, even if you did wrong, so an ordinary person would be responsible, you're not, unless you can show that there's a prior court case that said exactly what you did was wrong. And since there's always some difference, you know, the dog was big, the dog was little, the uh, person was standing up, they were sitting down, police officers never get held responsible. But I am gonna answer your question and tell you how I feel about qualified immunity, because if this had been uh, a normal conversation about policing, this would have been the first thing I said. And you're absolutely right, we, that was not the thing to talk about today. Uh, so the whole policing project is built off of a book I wrote called Unwarranted, Policing Without Permission. And it was because a light bulb went off in my head in, in 2006. Uh, and there's a funny law teaching story behind the light bulb, but the light bulb was this. We talk about accountability in government all the time. We've talked about government all, a lot tonight. And accountability in policing turns out to mean something completely different than in the rest of government. And that's where we've gone wrong. So in the rest of government, when we talk about accountability, what we mean is that legislative bodies get together in public, transparently, and they adopt policies that the people ostensibly want. We all know that goes wrong in every way imaginable, but that's, that's, that's the idea. Call that front-end accountability. In policing, when we want to hold people accountable, it's always on the back end after something's gone wrong. 
we want to bring a lawsuit against them. We want to prosecute officers. We want to have federal investigations. We want to have special monitors. We want to have body cameras so we can see. And where we've gone wrong in policing is in not focusing on the front end, on not creating rules and policies for how to do things so that the bad stuff doesn't happen. Uh, you know, you made the point, and I think there's some fairness to the point that, you know, a thousand people shot and killed may seem like a small number compared to 300 million people that live in the country. But that's the wrong question. It's completely the wrong question. The question is, did those thousand people need to die? Right. And not only that, but there's lots more that get jacked up that are the victims of uses of force. And the question is, does that all need to happen? And that wouldn't need to happen and wouldn't happen if we had the proper governance on the front end. Now, I will just say as a last word on this subject, I don't think you're ever going to fix policing by doing what a lot of people want, which is to get the blood of police officers after something's gone wrong. It's never going to work. What we should do, because there should be responsibility when terrible things happen, is that there, and there should be you know, liability, is the, 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 the employer should be liable. The breakage in this system is that it's hard to sue the cities and it's hard to make the cities pay. And then when the cities pay, they don't take it out of the budget of the police department. So the police department never wants to get any better. You know, if you don't clean your sidewalk when there's been a snowstorm and it's icy and somebody falls and breaks a hip, you're responsible. And because you know that you're responsible, what do you do? You clean the sidewalk. Yeah. Unless yeah. there's that responsibility in the system somewhere, the sidewalk never gets cleaned. Dude, I agree with you. I, I, well, I agree with you 100. That's exactly my what I was, what my common sense has led me to. That if you expect a policeman to start having liability insurance, and then of course the the, the policemen who have the most dangerous beats are going to have to pay the highest insurance, and they, you know, they can't get a raise. And I mean, it's, it just seems unmanageable. But yeah, sue the municipality. Absolutely, the municipality yeah. should pay. To, uh, and, and then, yeah, that, possible, that's what uh, I agree. Yeah. Is it possible, Barry, that policing is just sort of an impossible job? I mean, okay, we're going to pay you, you know, at best $90,000, and you have to be a psychologist, uh, you have to be uh, a soldier, you have to be a lawyer, you know, you have to be, yeah, it's a job that nobody can do. So know? I don't, I don't, I'm going to answer your question, then you have to let me go, because actually there's a policing thing I have to go deal with. But, okay. uh, but uh, um, mm. let me just ask my wife to keep the dinner warm. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, it's not an impossible job. It's a really hard job. I don't think people understand how hard it is. I didn't understand until I started to ride around in police cars how hard it is. I could not do the job. I would not want to do the job. Some people are incredibly good at it. Some people are incredibly bad at it. Um, we have this idea. We, two big ideas drive the policing project. One is this idea of front-end accountability. The other is an idea about reimagining public safety. So. Uh, uh, next time we talk, I'll tell you more, but I have a paper and I had a, a, a piece in the Wall Street Journal and we're working hard on this. In my dream world, you know, you're hearing a lot of people who are now saying correctly, uh, you know, the cops get asked to do all this stuff that they're not trained to do. Just what you just went down the list, social worker, lawyer, you know, confidant, the whole bit. So what if we actually imagine that instead of we've got these police cars driving around the city, you know, with people that have whatever pay they get, whatever education they have, and they've got a gun strapped to their side. Instead, we had cars driving around that said first on them. And the first responders were like the equivalent of emergency room doctors in this sense. You go to the emergency room, you see a doctor, that doctor's got three jobs. Stabilize you, fix the problem if they can, because they're generalists. And then if not, they send you on to a specialist to actually get the problem solved. So what if we had generalist first responders with four-year degrees who were taught dispute resolution, social services, basic EMS, you know, go down your list. And they had a different incentive system, which wasn't, you know, to get rewarded for arrests and stops, but to get rewarded for solving problems. I think that world's possible. That's the, you know, Noam's idea of taking smart people and putting them in a room and getting them to solve problems. I think we could move to that world. And that is... Uh, Part of what I'm working toward, and now you have to let me go. I got okay, to go. Barry, it was a pleasure. Happy New Year once again, and we'll see you again. It was really good. Nice to meet. Let's get him on again soon, okay? Hurry up. Okay. Nice to meet you. Now we have with us Manny Dorman. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Barry. I'll be in touch. Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Manny. Take care. Bye, Barry. Happy New Year. Thank you Bye. very much. We hope it's a good one.
Okay, was that a, what's that? Per, is that person? Person, that's Dan. Oh. <laughs> you I met Dan for You know who that is, of course. That's your friend's mom. And right. um, Hi, Manny. You know, the, cam the camera puts 10 pounds on you, so. Hi. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so, um, I don't oh, we, again, Dan, I got to tell you a great story before we go. You have something you want to say? Go ahead. You go first. No, I was just going to say, do we have any other? Yeah, yeah. Dan, what do you think about this? So Periel came to my house for New Year's. We invited her to a New Year's party, right? And uh, everybody got dressed. Wait, but I, 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 I could clarify that. Then you mute, you mute her mic. I, I put on a jacket. Um, it was a New Year's party. The kids got dressed up. Man, same party. No, like we we don't see anybody else though, right? Like yeah, it was just us. And 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 another friend came over. And outside, outside, Steve is here. He's been staying with me for six Everybody's weeks now. Everybody's in quarantine together, though. Right. We were going to spend New Year's. All, we we were doing New Year's Eve together. We 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 catered dinner from the chain from the Italian restaurant. Everything. Eleven thirty-five. Periel says. Okay, we're leaving now. I'm like, what do you mean you're leaving now? She goes, what do you mean? We're, it's time to go home. I'm like, it's 11.35. She goes, 9.30. What? She goes, what? You, you expected us to stay past midnight? I'm like, yes, it's a New Year's Eve party. Why would, well, who in the world wouldn't think you're staying past midnight when you're half the party? She goes, well, you, you didn't tell us you wanted us to stay till midnight. I'm like, tell you have you ever even seen a movie of a new year's eve party like like have you ever do you understand anything about new year's eve what it means to celebrate new year's eve dan yeah how do you account for this it's very strange <laughs> well, for it. first uh, of all it's not an it's not accurate it was well, nine, well, it was nine o'clock or no, 9 30. 11 35 that's totally it was not 9 30 it may have been 10 30. no it was earlier than that steve Steve, we'll have bring Steve in to uh, decide this. It, it's absurd to think okay. that you're going to leave New Year's Eve before midnight. Go ahead, Dan. Let Dan, let Dan talk. What? Well, I would just say, look, had she said, that is odd. Now, had she said, we're very tired. I know that it's New Year's Eve, but for what? And, but she didn't, it sounded to me like she thought it was normal, which is, <laughs> yeah. which is the weirdest part. In other words, she didn't say, you know what? I, I know it's New Year's Eve, but this, we got to do this. She just said, okay, bye. -bye. That I think is odd. I can't account for it. And then she said, okay, and we, 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 both, have, we both have seven year old uh, sons and they play together. And she's like, well, it's, I have a seven year old. He has to go to bed. I'm like, it's New Year's Eve. There's no school, he's on vacation. What's gonna happen? He can stay up till New Year's. All my kids stay up till midnight. Like, like, like this, like, she's trying to make me think like I'm, I'm a bad parent. You're going to let your son, you're going to let your son stay up past New Year's? What are you, should I call the Child son, Protective Services? Seven years old, you could have told him at 9.30 it was midnight. They wouldn't know the fucking difference. I don't lie to my kids. So it's in the end, so the kids. It's the ridiculous thing in the world to, to think that you have to stay up until midnight for with at a New Year's Eve. What, what, hold on, Manny wants to say something. Come, come here, come here. You got, you got to talk quietly and into the microphone, into the camera. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You don't, go ahead. Just say. Um, even if Daddy tried to lie, I would check the time and say, "You're lying, Daddy." Oh yeah, they actually know how to tell time at seven years old. By the way, for y'all, they wouldn't know the difference if at ten o'clock you're like, "It's time for bed. Happy New Year." No, I would go to the room and say, "I'm gonna check." He, did you know he wouldn't he, buy he, he, into the happy new year nonsense he would know did you know the years was at midnight yeah you tell the truth yeah all right making a stupid face tell the truth yeah all right get out of here get out of here this is this is crazy you should go, go to bed <laughs> it's midnight <laughs> it's midnight go to bed I mean, I think i've left i categorically almost every new year's eve party yeah. i've ever gone to before midnight I, I just, it's, it's ridiculous to think that, that, and, 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 I, and, to the, and your husband, Guy, I don't know which way he came out because he was, he was unusually and uncharacteristically quiet during all of this. It either meant, it either meant, oh, my fucking wife, and, or it could have meant, <laughs> what is with this dude? He really thinks now I got to stay here past midnight for his, for this asshole. I don't know where he was coming from. Listen, the thing is, is you're coming from the mentality of being at the club and really celebrating New Year's. No, I'm coming from the mentality of every single New Year's gathering that I've ever heard of on planet Earth. It involves a countdown. Happy New Year. 
Toast. No one was like Get busy oh. afterwards. I mean, that'd be. It's like you're going to a birthday party and you don't stick around for the presence of the cake. It's That's like, exactly what it's like. I had to make an analogy. That's yeah. right. You don't leave until they blow out the candles. You're like Happy New Year. Then you know the good night. I think we've, we we've we look we've we've uh, there's not much more to say about this. Periel obviously doesn't know much about New Year's traditions. <laughs> whatever. Um, I don't know if there's much more to say about this. I did want to discuss the article if, if we- uh, Go ahead, Dad. I, mean, I just want to say one more thing, which is that Noam was so uncharacteristically like in a good mood and like excited. I mean, that was, he was so excited about New Year's Eve. I've well, never seen him like that before. Well, my New Year's, I actually did, I was excited too because that was the first time I'd actually done anything in so long. I went to a friend of mine's house, we had takeout, um, and, uh, you know, I was out and about in a, in a way for the first time in like a couple of months, you know, other than when I was in Aruba, but, um, I, I did want to talk about Noam's, uh, he, Noam gave an interview. Noam's been out of the public eye for a long time. Noam used to be always being interviewed for this and that, but he gave an interview to uh, the Gothamist, which I guess is a uh, online something or other about, I, I think they might actually have a print, uh, go ahead. But anyway, he gave an interview about what he sees as the state of comedy. And it's a lot of the stuff we've already talked about on the show. He sees it coming back, that there's no real substitute for, for going out, that people want to go out, and that sometimes people just go out and comedy's an afterthought. They say, I'm going out, what should we do? So a lot of this stuff we've heard before. Noam, you know, he has certain themes that he hits over and over again. But one of the things that struck me in the article was Noam, once again, downplaying, it seemed to me, like, you know, as I see it, the comedy seller's success, he was saying up until five years ago, it was really touch and go. Um, and, you know, if this had happened five years ago, maybe they couldn't have survived it. As I recall, five years ago, I mean, things, were, things have been going, in my recollection, the comedy seller has been going gangbusters since about, uh, I would say, 2000. No, 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 no. What, what, no. What, what, what changed everything was when we opened the additional rooms. Now, maybe that was six years ago. I, I lost track of the time. But that, that's when, um, you can take that down now, Perio, if you don't mind. Um, that, uh, that was when uh, my, my um, situation changed for real. It was, the, it was the extra 200 seats. Even, even well, listen, when, when uh, no, in, in 2000, yeah, I mean, things, were, things were touch and go, right? He's thinking of the Louis show and that was tough. I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I didn't say business was touch and go then. What I said was that I wouldn't have been able to survive this, meaning that if business, if, if business went down to zero, um, personally, I, I would have had no money. I mean, I, I, I made a good living at that time, but I wasn't able to save any money. And I don't know how I would have lived a year without any income. I don't know what I would have done. Yeah, well, but what, how are the other club owners? Oh, also, another thing I wanted to discuss is, Noam, I, I tried to imagine other club owners giving an interview, and it, I always do this whenever. It, it, it absolutely, it go, if you read the article, and if you know anything about the clubs in New York City, it is absolutely so striking, the difference between Noam and the other club owners. I don't want to say the other club owners are, dumb they're not dumb they're they're scrappers okay they they're they generally al, al martin is pretty eloquent no uh yeah i i suppose it's just very tough to imagine for example you use the phrase hobson's choice in yeah, the marginally correct no other co comedy club owner would ever use the even though you didn't use it 100 percent correctly be that as it may no other club owner would ever use the phrase hobson's choice true or false uh, um, true, Dan. I think I, I'm say that's a true. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but um, I think one could one could bet with a reasonable degree of confidence. If I had to put money on it, I would I wouldn't be too nervous about losing that bet. I mean, for, for just for the record, on that Gothamist interview, they didn't tell me it was going to be um, published as a one-on-one -on -one interview. I I got the impression that I was they just wanted a quote or two from me for a larger article, which would include many other business people. So um, I didn't speak very carefully. I, you know, so there's a lot of conversational 
um, disjointed things that I wish I was surprised they didn't clean up. But all in all, it's, I'm getting a lot of positive feedback about the article. So, you know, I'm, I guess I'm happy with it. Just to be clear, Hobson's choice is take basically a take it or leave it choice. No, basically with, no choice at all. Yeah, but with Noam, Noam seemed to be using it as a choice between two bad options, which is, is how it's often used, but that's not what a Hobson's choice is. Well, by, you, you can see it either way, because okay. at some point, some business owners faced with the choice of losing everything or just opening in some sort of underground way, they may see they have no actual choice. I mean, well, like one, one, one I think classic uh, it, it, Hobbes' choice is I do this or you're fired, right? So, so that's kind of like do this or you're, you, know, you lose everything. So you, you could see it that, but then later on I put it slightly differently. So anyway, um, you could quibble with whether I use it particularly 100% accurately. I, um, I could sneak by, I think. I, I would, is there a difference between that and Sophie's choice? That's what I was just gonna say. Well, Sophie's choice is a movie. No, but it's an expression it, also. It, no, I've never heard any, but I mean, I guess people use the expression because it's a movie that's famous, so people use that expression. I don't hear it used often, but a Sophie's choice was, no, that's like a, a, like a horrific choice when you have it, I mean, it, I mean, you know, if you had to pick which baby was gonna die. That, right. So Hobbes' choice is defined as a choice of taking what is available or nothing at all. So, you know, nothing at all could be, um, you know, what's available is, is opening up and uh, nothing at all is uh, complying with the law, right? So it's, it, I think it's all right, actually. I anyway. Think, I think that it's really important just because of everything that's going on that we rearticulate um, the, the confines in, in which we're operating here to, to really carefully define the word New Year's, the phrase New Year's party. Well, again, I think we've gone through that. I don't well, know I, no, I'm really serious. I mean, especially because we've been so careful. Noam is really the only person, much to his chagrin, I'm sure. Much. That, <laughs> <laughs> that I've seen um, since March. I mean, since uh, June, rather. So, yeah, we have two families who basically live in a bubble. From time to time, I will see somebody like that. We had somebody who came over on New Year's, but um, he had to um, quarantine for seven days in his house and then took a day, took a test on the day of New Year's and came straight from the test immediately to my house, which is about as safe as you can get, um, you know, if you're going to see anybody. And, and that's, and that's what I did. And that was only because it was New Year's. But I, I think that's a, a safe protocol. Seven day hard quarantine and then a test and then go visit someone. I mean, nothing's perfect, but I think that's pretty safe. Uh, that's what we did. I also had to hear, hear it written down, uh, Noam, very quickly the, on New Year's Eve, speaking of New Year's Eve, the comedy seller for the first time ventured into online, uh, well, not the first time, but for the first time since the pandemic, I think, the comedy seller ventured into the world of virtual comedy with Mint Comedy, which is something that uh, Chappelle's former manager, uh, Mustafa, I don't know his last name, I think was involved. Uh, in. I will leave uh, you know, that's not my thing. I just, I just let them use the room. Oh, you let them use the room. Well, do you know how it went? It went, went well. It went well. They sold, I think, almost a thousand tickets. And um, the, the show, it was a three camera thing. And the show was... High quality. They they tested everybody. Um, they had thirty five people, I think, in the audience, and they tested everybody before they came in. Um, but uh, I didn't want to be involved in that. Um, uh, I I didn't want to get involved in a business way in that whole thing. For but now reasons. that you saw that it worked, and you had spoken to um, that Jarecki guy, I forgot his first name. Andrew Jarecki. Andrew Jarecki, who told you that this is a legitimate thing that he sees this even after the pandemic being a legitimate thing. You said a couple of episodes ago or last episode that you would, uh, or no, it was the New Year's Eve episode, that you yeah. said that you would really make an effort going forward to, to, to do virtual shows and you wanted Liz to spearhead it. No, I, what I said was a, a, after the pandemic, I'll look, if he thinks it's a, it's a winning thing, I'll take, I'll take a better look at it. And I told Liz, you know, you know but I, I, don't, I don't really, I don't, I'm not a believer in it. But you know, when Andrew, when somebody is smart and successful, as Andrew Jarecki says he believes in it, then you have to um, take a second look at it. You know, I just, I just think that the, um, well, we really sell it. He said that the, we could, we could um, monetize the fact that we're good curators, and I think people overrate the curating aspect of the comedy seller. I think that 
um, it's almost it's almost as if you have one bar which is really packed and the other bar which is empty. And the fact is, in the end, they're all selling the same alcohol, right? And I think the comedy seller, the the comedians basically, the, the comedians who perform at the comedy seller are available to every other club. And what we do, and we do a very, very good job of curating, which is the word that they use these days. However, there's a lot of other things that we do better than the other clubs, which, in, which um, end up in giving people a great fun night out at a reasonable price where they're treated well and friendly and they want to come back and the atmosphere is nice and the lights are twinkling and the vibe is right and there's happiness in the air. And all this kind of stuff is very, very magical and very difficult for other people to do. And I think when, if I had to try to make a living outside that, just through live streaming shows, essentially just through, I can pick a lineup better than anybody else. And this is how I'm going to dominate. I just don't, I'm not a believer in that. I think. Well, I think you're, you're half right. The fact is, yes, every comic is available to other clubs. However, there's two, there's two points. Number one, the other clubs don't necessarily, as, as, as obvious as it would seem, they don't, their goal is not necessarily to book the people that, they, that do the best on stage. They have other interests. They book people that they're managing oftentimes, people that they're friends with. There's that. There's another, and also some comics just don't want to work anywhere else. The Comedy Cellar, especially now because you've got the Comedy Cellar, the Comedy Cellar, the Village Underground, the Fat Black Pussycat. So a comic goes to, to your area of town. He can work. He can stay at the comedy cellar. He can stay at McDougal and Wester the whole night. He doesn't have to run around like a chicken with his head cut off. It used to be when I was doing comedy early on, people would run around all over. They do the cellar. They run up to the comic strip. They run over to stand up. They, I see less of that nowadays. I see because the comedy cellar allows you because you do four shows at the main room and three shows at the underground that you can basically just keep everybody there. And so um, you are monopolizing to some extent and then the drop-ins, the drop-ins that you sit, somebody don't see everywhere else, which you wouldn't, which you wouldn't have, by the way. Wouldn't on the have in the live stream. But, and also, but, we, also we treat the comedians, I think, much better than any other club does. I don't know why that is. It's not, it's not, a, not very challenging to treat people nicely, but I hear it all the time. Well, you have the restaurant. So the restaurant just creates a nice environment. It's yeah. a simple thing, but the fact that you can go to the restaurant and eat and, and hopefully, you know, you'll find a, a chef that really, to take that to another level would be really yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, and, and then the other thing is that live streaming is like, there's so much free content on YouTube and there's also um, uh, things that are already paid for, like Netflix where you subscribe, you know, and HBO and stuff like that. I just don't see why it is that people want to plunk down 7 to $10 to see a, a live show. On the, one, the one thing I mentioned to you on the New Year's Eve show, and it's worth repeating here, is that there's a slight difference between watching a Netflix stand-up special and a virtual show at the cellar is that you can do crowd work on a virtual show. On a Zoom show, I'll, you know, people, you, you can pick out, everybody's got their little picture in the corner with their name under it. You can say, hey, here's Joe. Hey, Joe, nice house. You know, whatever, like, you know, we, um, you see a guy with like, you know, uh, ant an antler. I did a show where there was a guy had like, you know, he was like a trophy hunter. So he had antlers all over the place. So I say, so, you know, you make a joke about that, um, you know, you, you can, you can, and the guy's bald. I could say, so, so Steve, you're bald now, you know, and then I make a joke about being bald. All right, we got to go. Well, um, it's not quite the same, but is it enough yeah. to, for people to want to see it? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Periel believes in it, but you know, um, and, I, and I won't just assume it's wrong because of that. Um, uh, Periel, uh, you should, Lou should probably maybe cut out the part about New Year's or cut that down because this, this other comedy stuff is probably interesting to people uh, who, you know, into comedy stuff. Um, all right, well, that, that was a good show. That guy, that guy Barry was pretty, uh, had a good vibe, right? Yeah, Smart he was, dude. Really, he was I didn't realize he was a con law professor. So. Manny, be careful, you're gonna, he thinks he's Rocky now. You know what, my son got punished today and he wasn't allowed to watch screens all day. And even well, though it was he wasn't all day, he wasn't allowed to use his iPad and stuff all day or watch YouTube. And uh, but the truth is we had one of our best days ever. We had a really good day. By the way, Noam, I, 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 Noam recommended a guitar. Oh, yeah. And I bought it. It's, it was 250 bucks, but I figured I might as well have a guitar that sounds good rather than like getting some used guitar, right? I guess. 
it, you know. So anyway, it should be here on Saturday. That's a pretty. I bought um, I bought Manny's guitars at Cordoba. Mila's beginning guitars at Cordoba. I have a, I have one which is like a, a um, like a thousand dollar one. But the like Mila's guitar, which I got for like three hundred dollars, it sounds as good as a very expensive guitar that I have. These are really. They make really good guitars. Yeah, I'll, I don't know if I'll stick with it. I mean, I can't guarantee it. But if I do, then look for me in 2010 playing at the Olive Tree. Oh, that'd be great. It'd be good enough by then. Maybe really you can write some jokes with it too, Dan. <laughs> but I don't know if I'll stick with it. I mean, right now I'm enthusiastic and who knows. But um, anyway. we have it Show us I don't have it yet. I don't have it. It's coming Saturday. But I've been studying some theory in the meantime because I got nothing else to do. All right, my son's about to hit himself in the face with, with barbells, so I got to go. All right, so happy new year. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Happy new year, everybody. Uh, Perry, I'll, can we just get it straight that next time there's a holiday or a birthday or New Year's, you have to, you have to stay until the, the obvious moments of the thing, whatever. I mean, All right, I everybody. Mean, Don't worry about it. I'm never inviting you to New Year's Eve again anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> See you next time. Hopefully next year. Right, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Again, stick with the skin flu. Perry, I'll go ahead. Say one more thing. I mean, I basically live in your house. Oh, my God, you're such an asshole.